Hi, everyone. Welcome to Pivotal Stories here at Spring One Platform 2018. I'm Jeff Kelly, and my guests are Brendan A. and James Webb. They're both Cloud Foundry platform architects at T-Mobile. Welcome, guys. Hello. And welcome back, I should say. Your second time joining us on the show. I appreciate it. Uh, and last time we chatted back in December, uh, I believe you just completed a successful iPhone launch. It was the iPhone 10. Uh, and, I, and I believe, my recollection is T-Mobile's website online channels was one of the only of all the major carriers to stay online yep. during the entire launch event. So obviously a successful uh, operation for you, and that's running on Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Now since then, of course, we've had another iPhone launch, and I believe they launched three iPhones this time. So I don't know if that means three times the, the traffic or three times the uh, excitement, but uh, how did that one go? Again, we had another great success. We had load testing prior to the event that we were able to test our expected volume levels on PCF and make sure that we didn't have any sort of issues. And once again, we really survived the night without major incident on our platform. There was a few other applications that were not running on PCF that had some problems, but all of our PCF applications, you know, didn't even break a sweat. We had a few different touch points and they were all very healthy. Well, that's good to hear. So why don't you catch us up a bit from when we talked last in terms of what your environment looks like today, how you've scaled it, kind of where do things stand, laid the groundwork for us. I think at this point we're up to eight or nine production foundations. I think as of this time last year, we had about 15 or 16,000 app instances. Now we're just close to 30. Um, so we've grew, almost doubled in size in the last year or so. Um, team size has been staying largely the same. We've had a few new hires, but for the most part, it's been um, the same level of operations that we've had previously. A little more interaction with the customers themselves um, with the increased load, but we're up to 1,800 developers total, about 500 of those active every month. Uh, so really a, a very big portfolio of, of apps and developers working on our platform. And just now starting to touch on PKS and Kubernetes as well. The ability to support ever-growing number of developers, but you don't need to expand the operations team to do that, uh, which is a, an important benefit, I think. So James, yeah, tell us a little bit about PKS and, and how you think about that at T-Mobile in terms of uh, using the Pivotal Container Service alongside the Pivotal Application Service, how they complement each other. And maybe we can dig into a little bit about what, what you're doing with PKS these days. So we're still very early stages. We look at PKS as a uh, enablement platform for things that don't fit naturally on the PCF. PCF is our first choice for apps, for especially for code that's written in-house. But a lot of vendors come with uh, pre-supplied containers or we have applications that require persistent storage and those just aren't good fits for our PCF platform. So we even have a couple of Docker applications running in PCF we'd like to see move off to PKS uh, to streamline our, our PCF operations. Um, so again, we're very early. We, we had an app go live in production about three weeks ago. Uh, very small, web-facing, uh, just taking a small amount of traffic in one data center, but it was a successful launch and everything looks good. We're looking forward to uh, more functionality that Pivotal is giving us in PKS 1.2, so expecting that soon, and that should be the, the impetus for us to really move forward with the platform. And you see those two abstractions, the application service and the container service living side by side, and it sounds like it's more of a complementary approach than an either or. Yes, definitely. Yeah, as James mentioned, we have a few of those Docker containers that are running on PCF. And typically during upgrades, if we're going to have problems with apps that aren't compatible, it's the ones that are running in Docker. Things are slightly different from one version to the next, and we've seen those customers having issues while the build, the build pack applications, uh, there's zero problems we've ever had with any of them. Ah, so those Dockerized applications are, the, are some good candidates potentially to move yep. over to PKS. And those primarily, like James mentioned, are the vendor supplied Docker containers, uh, you know, running things large and at scale. It might work fine in local tests, but the bigger you get, the harder it is to operate those on application service versus container service. And in terms of the common operational layer that is Bosch supporting both of them, how does that help you manage the environments? I think James and I both love Bosch. Uh, we, we have some additional open source efforts for Kubernetes that we're going on right now. And in the amount of time, you know, in the month or two we spent on those um, to get the VM provisioning worked out, get Kubernetes laid down. You know, Bosch, we have a Bosch release, you run a few commands and it's deployed. Um, and the whole day two operations piece of the upgrades, the uh, you know, the, the OS patching, the remediation, if there's a, some sort of incident on the OS itself, it, it all makes the process so seamless for us and consistent across both environments. So common plane for all the metrics and monitoring that comes out of that and for the, you know, the resurrector from Bosch to fix any problems as those come up as well. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a third abstraction coming, uh, Pivotal Function Service, based on Project Riff, and now uh, with Knative. Uh, does that play a, play a role in your future, you think, at T-Mobile, at whether specifically P PFS or just generally functions and serverless computing? Uh, yes, definitely. The four abstractions we're looking at is IaaS, platform as a service, container as a service, and function as a service. Uh, and we already have quite a bit of function as a service running in our public cloud providers. T-Mobile has their own abstraction they've built out called Jazz, 
which is designed to be a cloud agnostic function as a service provider, so it can tie into the AWS Lambda, for example. And we're looking for uh, PFS to be uh, you know, similar utility for that, for a lot of the on-premise stuff and going across multi-cloud approach. Um, but we do have a number of things that are called very infrequently that would be, would be much better served with a, a function as a service instead of running a persistent container um, or application in PAS. I mean, you talked a little bit about the criteria you think about in terms of what's going to run on PKS versus PAS, but do you, I mean, do you have a larger kind of decision framework that you've worked out? Uh, and, and how do you interact with some of the developers when they're making decisions what they want to use and working those kind of decisions out? Yeah, that's been a subject of a lot of uh, conversation at T-Mobile. We've, uh, working with our public cloud team, who also has their own large customer base, uh, we've been working on the appropriate level of abstraction that people should be looking at for their applications. So if it's something that we operate internally, that we wrote, that we have the source code control over, that probably belongs some Pivotal application service. If it's something vendor supplied, has to run in Docker, you know, container service makes more sense there. We have additional criteria for selecting uh, candidates for Pivotal function service, or for any function as a service. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something we want to make sure we steer people in the right direction. Right now, Kubernetes is cool. Teams that are T-Mobile are being told to containerize their application, so for a lot of them, that looks like uh, PKS. So we're trying to make sure that they're placing themselves there appropriately and not just doing what is uh, you know, the cool thing, but is the right thing for their application. If they don't need to maintain the CI CD for that Docker image for the next two or three or five years, they're much better off just trusting the build pack and letting that take, take care of the problems for them. Right, again, it's about working above that value line. Yes, exactly. It's back, it's back to the how Bosch and Pass helps us because that guarantees a certain level of consistency. When I deploy an app and push three instances, it's automatically deployed three AZs. During a patching process with Bosch, it knows what to do with that app, where Kubernetes, that puts a lot more onus back on the application teams to make sure they have properly configured uh, YAML to make sure that their app runs that way. So uh, it's going to be a journey for application owners to understand Kubernetes and what the right way to play on it is. So as a platform team, it's a lot more daunting for us to offer a Kubernetes service because we lose some of the guarantees we get with Cloud Foundry out of the box. Right? Yep. I think we also see uh, an overall lack of maturity with some of our dev teams. We come from a much more siloed approach where we have dev, test, and operations teams. So a lot of these developers are not experienced with operating their applications themselves. Even on, uh, on PAS, we see some problems with teams that don't quite understand how things work. So when you take that abstraction even higher, um, and you are even lower, I guess, uh, down to the PKS or uh, you know, trying to do, uh, operate on there, it becomes a lot more complex for them to operate, and they might not be making the right decisions when it comes to their application architecture. And, and this may be a little perhaps outside your purview, but what is T-Mobile doing to help those developers learn some of the things they have to think about when they're not just developing, but they're actually responsible for operating their yeah, applications? Uh, we have a number of different training opportunities for developers on-premise. Uh, we've partnered with Pivotal as well to deliver things like Pivotal Acceleration Lab to get developers trained up in how to develop cloud-native applications. And then beyond that, you know, uh, working with developers on choosing the appropriate abstraction, making sure they have sort of a decision tree they can walk down so that, at the very least, they land themselves in the right spot, and then they can learn how to dive in and, and build to that application, or that platform itself. You mentioned multi-cloud earlier, your multi-cloud strategy. Could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, I mean, I think generally we know some of the benefits of that is it gives you some, obviously, flexibility uh, to, to run the workloads in the right environment. Um, but could you articulate a little bit more kind of your thinking mind at T-Mobile and, and really how you've implemented it and how it's benefiting you? Yeah, so it's still a work in progress, I would say. Our general idea is that we want developers to learn a different abstraction than a cloud provider's API. So if you need to de deploy your application on AWS versus on-premise versus GCP or Azure, your experience should not be different. You should not have to learn a whole new set of APIs and, and redevelop your whole, uh, your whole tooling around that. Um, just as Bosch makes it easy for us as platform operators to deploy to multiple providers, whether it's uh, you know, uh, on-premise on OpenStack or vSphere or AWS or GCP, we say give me a VM and Bosch spits out that VM. We want, our, we want our developers to have that same experience, abstract them away from the underlying API of these cloud providers, and allow them to say CF push or uh, you know, uh, deploy their application with, with uh, kube control and be able to have that same experience across all cloud providers. And one thing we chatted about earlier, which caught my attention, you mentioned uh, this, this concept of the practice of, uh, of chaos engineering. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. I know, in, of course, in a distributed environment, things can, things can go wrong, things can happen, and uh, I guess chaos engineering is a, is a way to prepare yourself for some of those unknowns. Yeah. Talk about what you're doing there. Yeah, so um, I'd say as platform operators, we introduce a fair amount of chaos ourselves unintentionally. Uh, but really the goal is to, to build more of a practice around intentionally introducing chaos into the platform and application layer in order to test the resiliency of these apps. So we have a talk tomorrow given by um, Rubesh and Karun from our team 
um, who have built out a, uh, a systematizing the Bosch to allow developers to uh, eventually self-service chaos testing for their app, where they can say, I want to block my application's traffic to a database service, or to other apps, or to the underlying rep process on the Diego cell themselves. With the goal being that what happens if this application loses its connection to the outside world, or to its database, or its message bus, or, um, you know, if if different platform components themselves start to go away, if you lose a MySQL node or lose a, uh, you know, a Go router, what happens to the underlying platform and the apps themselves? And how are we able to, to make this easier for app teams to consume in a way that's still safe for the enterprise as a whole? There's a little structure around the way you do chaos engineering. Yes. Which, yeah, it's a little ironic. Ordered chaos. Yeah. Ordered chaos, there, I like that. Um, well, great. So as we wrap up, um, you know, what are we looking at over the next, say, 6, 12 months? Uh, what, what are some of your priorities? Bringing PKS to a fully functional platform, right? And bringing the, the, the enterprise uh, bits and pieces that make it a, a usable experience versus here's a cluster, figure it out yourselves. So we're, we're really working hard on that. Yeah, I'd say that, that's, that's a good point. PKS is really built around the, the, uh, the mindset of having very experienced development teams. And with the transition period we, we want to have in place here, we really have to figure out a way to put in some guard, guardrails on the Pivotal's helping us develop for PKS that keeps developers from making the wrong mistakes or doesn't give them the same access they may have if they were a very advanced team that's able to really manage and administer their own cluster. Awesome. Well, it looks like we may have a special guest here, gentlemen. Uh, uh, look at James, how you guys it's doing? Chad, our, our longtime friend Chad is here for I, a visit. I saw you guys were here and I said, I've gotta, I've gotta uh, break the scene here. Hopefully I don't break this table. You guys are awesome friends, customers. Just for what it's worth, this is completely off the beaten track here, but how often do we jump on Zooms and talk on, on con calls? At least once a week, yes. Uh, so one thing that I think is really cool is great partnerships are intimate. You guys challenge us. Uh, you push us to be better. Uh, about half the stuff in the PKS backlog has been highly influenced uh, sure. by your input. And I just want to say thank you. I want to say T-Mobile's awesome. Uh, you're not only a customer of ours, I'm a customer of yours. T-Mobile Tuesdays, excellent. And I wanted to show my pride you can't plan this. <laughs> Do you see that? I like it. Nice. Well, hey, I got some cloud battery socks on. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> I told you I had them. We did not plan that, but I just wanted to say thank, thank you, you and sorry to interrupt, I, Jeff. Hey, anytime, Jed. You're welcome on this stage. Uh, guys, thank you. Thank you, Jed. Thank you for challenging us. <laughs> <laughs> We've enjoyed the partnership as well. It's been, it's been good for all. Yeah, it, it's a pleasure for us to see a company we can work with where we can say, here's a feature we need, here's a pain point we have, and within a month or two, we generally see a, a release track for that where it will be put out and allow us to consume it. So not only do we talk about fast iteration and you guys do fast iterations, we do it together and that's magic. Yep. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs>